What do you believe the phrase no prayer in school actually means? If you live in the United States and you are a Christian, there's a good chance that you believe that the federal government has outlawed praying in public schools. You may believe that students caught praying are generally instructed to stop, that wearing religious apparel is discouraged, and that religion is generally not permitted on campus. The constitutional mandate of separation of church and state does not actually prohibit religion or the free expression thereof for public school students. In fact, students are free to pray as much or as little as they wish. They can say grace to themselves or to their friends before lunch. They can ask God for his grace before a test. Students are also free to wear crosses, yarmulkes, and other religious apparel and regalia. Students can also form faith-based extracurricular activities. Teachers are permitted to wear the same apparel and identify themselves by their faith. Teachers may also reference religion while in class under most circumstances. The Bible, Quran, and other religious texts can be referenced as they relate to history, ethics, and cultural comparisons. If you went to a public high school, you probably learned about the Protestant Reformation in history class and or any number of other religious events throughout history. Furthermore, public schools provide assistance to religious students, such as transportation to private religious schools at public expense and permission for students to leave to attend religious services. Students are normally allowed to be absent to observe religious holidays and suffer no academic penalties. In short, religion is not only permitted within the walls of public schools, but it is given many concessions. So what does no prayer in school actually mean? And what is actually being enforced? Public schools simply do not permit the faculty to lead students in prayer or to allot a specific time in class for prayer. In either case, participation in a spiritual practice or organized religion would become mandatory. Even if the teacher allots a specific time in class for prayer, but does not lead the prayer themselves, and even if students are allowed to sit quietly and not directly participate, the student's attendance to the class itself is mandatory. The religion is established, made official, and at least in some way compulsory and not optional. If you are mandated to go to church, but allowed to sit in the back and not pray, you are still mandated to be there in the first place. There are other ways a public school could run afoul of establishing a religion. If the nativity is positioned by the front entrance of school, for example, religion is established. If a crucifix hangs in the auditorium instead of a church, religion is established. No prayer in school is simply the way the argument is often cited. In summary, no prayer in school does not violate religious freedom, because if the presence of religion within a government institution is ever mandatory, then that violates religious freedom. Constitutional scholars and lawyers may explain it differently than that, but generally reach the same conclusion. A public school in the United States is a microcosm of the United States because it encapsulates in miniature the characteristics and qualities of the nation. A secular institution with a predominantly religious population in which religion is always optional but never mandatory. With this microcosm in mind, it should also come as no surprise that those who wish to institute mandatory religion in public schools also wish to institute mandatory religion throughout the nation. They believe that the United States is fundamentally Christian and that our laws, institutions, and society at large must reflect this. As a theological position, this is often called dominionism, taking its name from a passage from the Holy Bible. As a political position, it is often called Christian nationalism. The two terms are somewhat different and their exact meanings are debatable, but they are generally used interchangeably. Anything that even resembles the promotion of a theocracy should be considered an extremist position. Nevertheless, this Christian nationalism is promoted in the mainstream every time a right-wing politician or a socially conservative televangelist calls the United States a Christian nation, a common refrain that every citizen has heard countless times before. 
Christian nationalism is also the foundational political and theological perspective of the Christian film series God's Not Dead. Each film tends to vary in how strongly it advocates for Christian nationalism, but each film still promotes three related beliefs. The United States is suffering because the nation is becoming more secular and consequently less Christian. Christianity is under attack from the non-Christian population of the United States, especially its academic institutions and government. And finally, Christians are facing incredible discrimination heretofore unseen in the history of the United States. These related concepts form the overall thesis of the God's Not Dead film series and Christian nationalism. The United States is a Christian nation, and Christians must reclaim this nation. These concepts are all false, as will be explained later. Each film engages with these related beliefs. In the first film, a liberal atheist journalist named Amy interviews a conservative couple in an aggressive manner, and shortly thereafter she is told that she has cancer. A Christian student named Josh is forced to write, God is dead, in order to advance in a philosophy class taught by an atheist professor. A Muslim named Aisha wishes to convert to Christianity, but when her father discovers this, he abuses her and throws her out of the house. In God's Not Dead 2, a teenager named Brooke is depressed following the tragic loss of her brother and finds hope only when she is told to read the Bible. A Christian teacher named Grace answers a question in class about a historical comparison of Martin Luther King to Jesus and subsequently faces legal action. Under the circumstances mentioned earlier, this would probably not violate church-state separation in the real world. A prosecutor uses this as an opportunity to, in his words, prove once and for all that God is dead. In the third film, the people are filled with an amorphous hostility that can only be resolved by Reverend David Hill, the only recurring character in every movie. The local college wants to shut down a church and replace it with a student center. A church nearly burns down and the fire results in the tragic passing of Reverend Jude. Yet, even with these points touched upon in all three films, this Christian nationalism is most prevalent in the fourth film in the series released in 2021, God's Not Dead, We the People. The most current film in the GND cinematic universe is yet another story of beleaguered Christians persecuted in the United States. A government official from social services makes an unannounced visit to a Christian homeschool. Because this is a God's Not Dead movie, she is appalled that the unlicensed teacher is educating the students about Christianity. This is absolutely allowed in the real world, but okay. A judge grants the Christians one week to prove that their homeschool is as good as or better than public school, or else the children will be forced to attend a dreaded secular institution. Reverend David Hill leads the homeschool parents to Washington, D.C. to testify before a subcommittee about the efficacy of homeschooling. However, everything that the Reverend and the parents argue is related to Christianity and not really homeschooling. This is the trick of every God's Not Dead movie, presenting Christianity as fundamental to the United States, but under attack by the United States. An important preface. Christian nationalism is not the unanimous position of Christianity, and most Christians in the United States are not Christian nationalists. No political ideology or political party has exclusive rights to Christianity. The subject matter herein relates to the Christian right and Christian nationalism. Although not every right-wing Christian considers themselves a Christian nationalist, Christian nationalism itself is still a far-right position. So, why does the Christian right generally believe that the United States is a Christian nation? Christian nationalism is not a proclamation of simple majority. It is a proclamation of faith, a codification of particular values, a flag planted in the soil of the United States in the shape of a cross. Christian nationalists often cite famous quotes on the subject of God by major American politicians. President James Madison once stated, we have staked the whole future of American civilization not on the power of government, far from it. We have staked the whole of our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, 
upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves according to the commandments of God. The future and success of America is not in this Constitution, but in the laws of God upon which this Constitution is founded. To modern conservative politicians, it is an article of faith that the United States is a Christian nation, and their efforts to shape the laws to this end are well documented. To liberal politicians, lip service is given to the Christian nation term, but without any intention of actually changing the laws to favor Christianity. For liberal politicians who do not believe it, the subject still feels too dangerous to broach and catastrophic to contradict. In 2008, when a video surfaced showing Barack Obama remarking in 2006 that the United States is not solely a Christian nation but a nation of many faiths and even non-believers, he was excoriated from the right. So put more simply, what does any of this even mean? It means that for Christian nationalists, Christianity is not only the majority religion but should be the official religion, and that laws should reflect Christian values. Laws that reflect more secular values or the values of other faiths should not be permitted. The Christian right uses the aforementioned quote and others to justify this position, as though the United States were a plot of land which a religion could claim ownership. God's not dead, we the people makes this claim of ownership as well. In one scene, the good reverend states that the first Thanksgiving was a Christian feast, and that the Native Americans being there is mostly irrelevant. He says that people focus too much on the togetherness of Thanksgiving between the pilgrims and Native Americans and not enough on the fact that this was a Christian tradition. The natives, he says, were merely guests at this Christian tradition. God's not dead, and the Christian right in general want Americans to think of American traditions as exclusively Christian traditions. In truth, much of the story of the so-called First Thanksgiving is a myth, as is the founding myth told by the Christian right. God's Not Dead, We the People is especially interested in running interference for the Founding Fathers. The Reverend meets with Congressman Darrell Smith, a Christian ally. Smith defends the Founding Fathers from accusations of racism, noting that while some owned slaves, many did not. Hashtag not all presidents. If that were not bad enough, he also defends the practice as a product of its time and absolves slave-owning Founding Fathers of their actions because they were, as he puts it, only kids. Most of them were just kids. Edward Rulich and Thomas Lynch both were just 26 years old when they signed the Declaration of Independence. Wow, there is a lot to unpack. First, 26 is not a kid, not by today's standards and certainly not by the standards of the 18th century. And Thomas Jefferson was the ripe old age of 33 when he helped write it. A kid at 33 is an even more ludicrous statement. Second, the film is using an arbitrary age point, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Yes, Jefferson was only 33 when he helped write it, but he owned slaves his entire life afterward and lived to be 83 years old. Third, owning slaves is not a youthful indiscretion, like spray-painting a wall or stealing a candy bar. To avoid accusations of racism, the filmmakers hired Isaiah Washington to play the slavery apologist. Washington is a conservative Republican best known for repeating right-wing conspiracy theories and getting fired from a television series following accusations of shouting homophobic slurs. Obviously, the film's opinions on slavery do not reflect those of black Americans in general. It is manipulative and duplicitous to cast arguably the only famous black actor who would repeat this opinion. <sighs> so, why does God's Not Dead care so much about running interference for the Founding Fathers anyway? What does this even have to do with Christianity? Christian nationalism demands that the founders of the nation be Christian and above reproach. This is the groundwork to the claim of Christian ownership of the nation, that the United States required the moral guidance of Christians to be made. If the founders were not Christian, or not moral, this claim falls apart even under its already spurious logic. Debating the individual moralities of each founder is challenging, but many of the facts of their respective religious convictions are well known, and decidedly un-Christian. Many founders were influenced by the Enlightenment-era theology of deism, 
a philosophical position that observable facts of the natural world are enough to suggest that the universe has a creator, that miracles are superstition, and that organized religion and religious authorities are not required for said beliefs. According to David L. Holmes, author of The Faiths of the Founding Fathers, the religious beliefs of the founders seem to have fallen into three categories, non-Christian deism, Christian deism, and Orthodox Christianity. Here are examples of all three. Benjamin Franklin was the first prominent American deist and the most universal American of his time. Although Washington's most common term for God was providence, he also used such terms as heaven, the grand architect, the deity, and the great ruler of events. On the spectrum of early American religion, he would clearly be classified as a deistic Christian. Patrick Henry's will declared that the religion of Christ would give his family the inheritance which will make them rich indeed. Henry would clearly be classified as an orthodox Christian. Other deists included Thomas Paine and Ethan Allen. Oh, and God's Not Dead's favorite slave-owning president? Thomas Jefferson was a committed deist who was absolutely convinced that the Twelve Apostles invented the claim that Jesus was divine only after his death. Jefferson even used a penknife to cut out sections of the Gospels that he believed were superstitious and unreliable. He once called himself a Christian only in the way that he suspected Jesus would have wanted, believing in some of his principles but not in the supernatural. Great reference, God's Not Dead. You really nailed that one. The Founding Fathers were not all Christians, but even if they were, that fact alone would not stake a claim to the United States by Christianity. The religion of the founder of an institution is not automatically conferred upon that institution. Although God is mentioned in passing in several important historical documents in the United States, God is not written into the law. The Constitution of the United States does not establish an official religion. It explicitly opposes the establishment of an official religion, Christianity or otherwise. Remember that James Madison quote at the beginning of this section about the commandments and God? Well, Madison did say that, but he was also fully committed to the separation of church and state. In 1785, Madison wrote a petition called Memorial and Remonstrance, laying out 15 arguments against government support of churches. Madison, the chief architect of the United States Constitution itself, was not only in favor of the clause that separates church and state, but his original proposal for the clause was even more descriptive and even more explicit about the United States having no formal religion, and no religion above another. Quotes and utterances by famous founding fathers on the subject of God are reflections on their personal beliefs and definitely not theocratic proposals. Without a doubt, Christianity has certainly influenced the culture of the United States, but there is a difference between the culture and the Constitution. According to Andrew L. Seidel, author of The Founding Myth, our country's government and laws are distinct from its society and culture. It is the difference between our constitutional or legal identity and our popular or social or cultural identity. Finally, it needs to be understood that even if the Christian rights claim about the Founding Fathers and the founding of a Christian nation were true, it would still not justify transforming the United States into a theocracy today. It's just important to understand that the description of their argument is false on its face even before interrogating their prescription, meaning the recommendations based on the erroneous content of the argument. Their prescription is a Christian nation, effectively a theocracy. The consequences and harm of a theocracy cannot be ignored by stating that it might have been what John Hancock wanted. A tradition is not self-justifying. A tradition must be interrogated in order to determine whether or not it should continue to be followed. So let's do that now. In God's Not Dead, We the People, Reverend David Hill holds his Bible with personal adoration, as well as hostile admonishment, telling the Congressional Subcommittee that we have lost the truth of the world because Christianity has become, in his words, unpopular and politically incorrect. 
With regards to the former, Christianity is not unpopular. It remains the largest religion in the world by far. Moreover, Christianity has actually lost very little popularity over time, as the percentage of Christians who lived in the year 1900 and the percentage of Christians who lived in the year 2000 are nearly identical. While the rate of new Muslims is growing at a slightly higher rate than new Christians, studies show that Christianity is still expected to remain the world's most populous religion in the next few decades. Christianity had a 600-year head start. There is no reason whatsoever to expect Christianity to lose significant ground or to fade into obscurity this century, or next century, or perhaps ever. What the Reverend is actually lamenting is the loss of the absolutism of reverence for God. He is lamenting the loss of a fundamentalist perspective. Modern biblical scholarship often views the Holy Bible as something to be taken seriously, but not literally. That the Bible contains the ideas of a people and its prophets in their contemporaneous settings, and the struggle to understand the vast existential and moral questions of the universe. Fundamentalist scholarship instead posits that the books of the Bible are completely literal, and that damnation awaits all those who do not see this truth. All of humanity must convert not only to Christianity, but to a specific sect of Christianity, people they call true Christians. Nobody else is saved. Because of these consequences, any action, law, or society that does not conform to the literal word of the Bible is morally reprehensible, and that opposition to this immorality can take any form deemed necessary. Reverend David's claim that the old ways were better is a variation of a logical fallacy called argumentum ad antiquitatum, more commonly as well as more simply called the appeal to tradition. An appeal to tradition is a proposal based on the assumption that a traditional practice must be good, or at least better than its more recent modern alternative. An appeal to tradition is a logical fallacy because it exists within a kind of logic circle without a proper thesis or conclusion. This is because the argument is effectively, we ought to continue this tradition because it is a tradition. Something more than that is needed. Evidence is needed. The Christian right engages in this logical fallacy by claiming that a previous supremacy of Christianity in the United States was inherently good, moral, and advantageous for the nation, whereas the modern alternative of greater secularism is inherently bad, immoral, and disadvantageous. This argument is a fallacy because it's based on historical preference and religious bias, not factual evidence. In order to prove this argument, one would need to present evidence that life prior to a set date, say the beginning of the 20th century, was overall better for the people of the United States than it was after that date. Arguing that life was overall better for everyone comes from a position of great, even aristocratic privilege. Even if one could make this argument well, one would also have to tie the so-called better life of the past as a byproduct of Christianity specifically. Religious and secular attitudes do help shape society, but there isn't always a direct through line in which one can either credit or blame these attitudes for every facet of society or daily life. The Christian right doesn't see it that way, and blames all modern problems on a lack of fundamentalist adherence to the literal word of the Holy Bible. If there is an economic downturn or an increase in unemployment, the Christian right blames this lack of adherence. People have lost their way, and if they turn back to God, the economy will somehow just sort itself out. The problem cannot be capitalism, especially for the huge portion of the Christian right that believes in prosperity theology, the belief that both affluence and poverty are ordained by God. If there is an increase in crime, they will claim that this is the result of marriage equality. If there is a new disease, they will claim that this is the result of the advancement of reproductive rights. The Christian right sometimes blames natural disasters as well as man-made disasters on unrelated aspects of the modern world, often blaming the victims of a tragedy for their tragic circumstances. There's never been a civilization ever in history that has embraced homosexuality 
and turned away from traditional fidelity, traditional marriage, traditional child rearing, and uh, uh, has survived. There isn't one single civilization that has survived that ha openly embraced homosexuality. Something happened a long time ago in Haiti, mm -hmm. and uh, people might not want to talk about it. They were under the heel of the French, uh, you know, Napoleon the mm -hmm. Third and whatever, and they got together and swore a pact to the devil. They said, we will serve you if you'll get us free from the French. Mm. It's a true story. Every time the United States gets involved in some kind of a pressure on Israel to uh, split their land, there's some natural disaster that happens here in America. The problem with debating this and providing evidence to the contrary is that the Christian right is not measuring the goodness of society or the health of society by observable means. They are measuring society based on the harm done to an unseen supernatural plane of existence. When the Christian right brings up modern problems and blames them on secularism, they are only using these instances to provide something that appears measurable, something that we can witness. It's not actually dipping its toes into fact-based evidence. Instead, it is pointing out occurrences of the supernatural world colliding with the natural world signs of the supernatural world within ours. The God's Not Dead film series is full of attacks on Christianity, direct assaults on the faith. Yes, I hate God. There are few, if any, direct attacks on Christianity in the United States at least in terms of the government or its major institutions. So why does the Christian right believe otherwise? Because the Christian right views unrelated social progress as infringing on the God-given right to maintain a Christian nation. The social progress is not directly related to Christianity and does not directly confront Christianity, but the Christian right views everything through the lens of Christianity. Through this lens, they see a topic unrelated to their actual rights and unrelated to the day-to-day -day activities of their religion, but claim exclusive ownership of that topic. Then, when the topic is debated and their exclusive ownership is not acknowledged, Christians claim that they are being discriminated. Here is a modern example. Same-sex couples having equal access to be legally married is a constitutional right, arguably granted to them by the Due Process Clause in the 5th and 14th Amendments, as well as the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment. Marriage equality does not prevent men and women from marrying one another. It certainly does not prevent Christians from marrying one another. And due to the separation of church and state, clergy retain the right to refuse to officiate any wedding. It may be true that a right-wing Christian who works for the government may be involved in issuing a marriage license which they do not personally approve, but the government office itself is a secular institution, and the occupation itself is a secular career. Thus, there is no aspect of same-sex marriage that actually assaults Christianity because the occupation and issuance itself is secular, and the employee's faith, in this case, is immaterial. The change that allowed for same-sex marriage did not change the church. The change only allowed equal access to a secular institution. However, the Christian right claims all marriage as the exclusive domain of their God, and Christian nationalists specifically view marriage as a legal privilege, not a right, one that is to be doled out exclusively by Christians at their discretion. That is why the conflict in the God's Not Dead films does not reflect discrimination against Christians in the real-world United States, but instead is viewed through a more hyperbolic lens the exaggerated perspective of Christian nationalists that does not feel exaggerated in their own minds. In the first film, Josh is ordered to write God is Dead by an extremely hostile professor, or else he will not advance in his class. This is not something that can happen, and Christians who believe this was inspired by a true event have been suckered into a Christian urban legend propagated on Facebook. 
And then they all clapped. Atheist philosophy professors certainly exist, but they do not require you to abandon your faith and become an atheist in the first day of class to get a passing grade. That is absurd! They also generally do not delight in embarrassing their students, but God's Not Dead sure showed Professor Radisson by killing him with a car in the end. What happened here tonight is a cause for celebration. This does not happen, but Christian nationalists believe that secular academia is immoral and that it is indoctrinating people into damnation. The truth is exclusively owned by their god and proselytized by Christians. If universities do not teach what Christians believe is the truth, then Christian nationalists believe this is discrimination. They claim exclusive ownership. In God's Not Dead 2, the teacher's fleeting reference to Jesus in the historical, cultural, and comparative context would probably not land her in any real trouble in the actual United States. But because Christian nationalists believe that mandated prayer in public schools is as harmless as her fleeting reference, this does not feel like an exaggeration to them. They claim exclusive ownership. The prosecutor becomes practically aroused by the idea of killing God, which is not something anyone says. We're going to prove once and for all that God is dead. However, Christian nationalists do not see the existence of a secular life as simply an option for how an individual can live, but as the path to damnation. They do not see secular institutions simply as neutral establishments, but as idols to godlessness. So, when they see the prosecutor in rapturous joy at the prospect of disproving God and banishing him from even being uttered aloud, it feels real to them. In God's Not Dead, We the People, a social worker shuts down a home school for teaching too much Christianity. When they defend themselves during a televised congressional subcommittee, the House representatives are openly hostile to Christianity. But surely you recognize how offensively patriarchal and sexist the Bible is? That would never happen. First, the religious composition of the 117th Congress, which includes the House and Senate, is overwhelmingly Christian. It's not even close. Out of more than 500 members, only one would admit to not being affiliated with any religion. The idea that Congress is hostile to Christianity is laughable. However, because Christian nationalists believe they have a claim of ownership to the United States, Congress's refusal to grant them this ownership is seen as discrimination. The idea that Congress would be openly hostile to Christianity with the cameras on is ridiculous. Even if they were personally hostile, which is doubtful, they would never do it like that. But this feels real to them. The scrolling court cases at the end of every God's Not Dead movie are far more mundane than anything in the films, and in almost every case, they are not examples of actual discrimination against Christians, but cases of Christians discriminating against others and thinking that's just okay. Usually it's same-sex couples. God's Not Dead We the People takes aim at the public school system, but not by addressing its actual problems. Remember, the Christian right points out observable modern problems and draws a supernatural conclusion not based on facts. If public schools are failing, it cannot be the result of lack of funding or anything quantifiable. It must be the result of a lack of God. A public school curriculum in the United States is actually fairly conservative, nationalistic, amerocentric, and moving even further right these days, especially with new laws in the wake of the anti-critical race theory outrage machine, God's Not Dead is not criticizing these aspects of the school system that would be criticizing from the left. Instead, God's Not Dead is criticizing the school system from the right, demanding that schools become even more conservative and demanding an alternative not so that parents have another option, but in an effort to replace the current option. Christian nationalists do not believe that their faith is optional. That is the core of their beliefs. Put more simply, if the United States is a Christian nation and Christianity is under attack by the government and the population, then the government and population must change to better suit Christianity. The 
The word liberty is generally defined as freedom from oppression. In contrast, when the Christian right defines liberty, their definition is practically the opposite. According to Presbyterian minister and journalist Chris Hedges, author of American Fascists, The Christian Right and the War on America, Dominionists and their wealthy right-wing sponsors speak in terms and phrases that are familiar and comforting to most Americans, but they no longer use words to mean what they meant in the past. Liberty is not about freedom, but the liberty found when one accepts Jesus Christ and is liberated from the world to obey him. When used by the Christian right, the term liberty means the liberty that comes with accepting a very narrowly conceived Christ and the binary worldview that acceptance promotes. God's Not Dead, We the People uses this version of liberty throughout the film. The Christian characters do not believe in liberty in the traditional sense of the word. They believe liberty is what is being denied only them, the right to conform the nation to its rightful Christian identity. And secure the blessings of liberty. 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 This contrarian version of liberty is commonly taught to children in Christian private schools. And, more relevant to the subject of this film, it is taught in Christian homeschools. Again from Chris Hedges. America's providential history is the standard textbook on American history used in many Christian schools. It is also a staple of the homeschooling movement. In this book, the authors define the term liberty as fealty to the spirit of the Lord. The work of liberty is an ongoing process, one mounted by Christians, to free a society from the slavery imposed by secular humanists. This process frees or eradicates different moral codes and belief systems to introduce a single uniform and unquestioned Christian orientation. Liberty, in a linguistic twist worthy of George Orwell, means theocratic tyranny. The goal of a uniform Christian morality for the United States is seen in a subplot that resolves the storyline between Aisha and her father Mizrab from the first movie. What happened here tonight is a cause for celebration. The father visits Aisha in the hospital. Prior to this, they had been estranged for years because Aisha converted to Christianity. The film is not content to simply have the father and daughter reconcile and respect each other's faiths. A fundamentalist view of Christianity does not allow for other faiths. Instead, Misrab has an epiphany about the nature of Jesus Christ, presumably leading to another conversion to Christianity. The Christian version of liberty, meaning fealty to the Lord, simply cannot allow for any other conclusion. During the congressional hearing, a representative brings up the Christian rights homophobia. Reverend Dave says that Christians are not intolerant, and his evidence is an unrelated fact about volunteer work. The Christian right sometimes uses the charity of some Christians to deflect criticism, stating with admittedly some accuracy that an enormous amount of volunteer work across the world is conducted by Christians. However, this fact does not support the overall goodness of a potential Christian theocracy, nor does it support the overall goodness of homophobia. It only supports the overall goodness of volunteer work. If someone opposes the Christian right's intolerance of gay people, responding with, Christians aren't intolerant, we do charity work, is a non-sequitur. This is a separate topic. The response reframes the argument. The actual argument is, being intolerant of gay people is harmful to them individually, and imposing that intolerance through either social enforcement or legal enforcement is harmful to them collectively because it instills an unequal second-class status. A religious conviction, no matter how sincere it may be, cannot justify measurable, quantifiable harm or the enforcement of a coercive social hierarchy. This argument is reframed and reduced by the Christian right to Christians are bad. By reframing and reducing the argument, the Christian right can deflect any criticism of either Christianity or social conservatism with an unrelated fact about Christians and the good that they sometimes do. 
Christian nationalists bristle at the word tolerance because their fundamentalist doctrine does not allow for acceptance of anything that they believe is contrary to said doctrine. They counter that we must be tolerant of their intolerance, a gotcha that aims to conclude the discourse and continue their goal of Christian nationalism unabated. Nonetheless, this gotcha is not so much an argument as it is wordplay. This counter simply uses the same word even though tolerance for intolerance would be better described as appeasement, making concessions to the aggressor or instigator. This gotcha is also clearly made in bad faith because the Christian nationalist claiming that tolerance must extend to intolerance is not actually committing to being tolerant. A Christian nationalist does not want tolerance extended to intolerance because that would mean he would also be tolerant of everything up to and including his intolerance, together with gay rights, trans rights, equality of religion under the law, and so forth. The Christian nationalist, instead, is only demanding whoever is on the other end of the argument commits to being tolerant, and that tolerance must be exclusive tolerance for Christianity. At the end of the film, Reverend Dave makes this impassioned speech to Congress a la Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, and then everyone stood up and clapped again. The God's Not Dead series is not simply four bad movies. The series is a call to action, and in the case of the latest film, the call is given even more directly to the audience. We, the people. It's recruitment propaganda for Christian nationalism. Almost anyone who would pay to see God's Not Dead in the theater is already a Christian. So this movie is not going to do much to convert anyone to Christianity, but it could influence Christians to move to the right. We can counter this propaganda by doing better about engaging with this threat and debunking common arguments, but that will only do so much. Christian nationalism must be defeated by other Christians. There has been a recent movement among Christian groups within the United States to combat this, and there are resources in the description for more information on how you might want to get involved. There is a lot to overcome, though. The right wing has been beating this drum and recruiting for a long time. The right wants you to be a Christian soldier, to advance the goal of establishing a Christian theocracy in the United States.